Hey, welcome to Creative Block. I'm your host, V. Um, it's just me today because this is going to be a little quick episode. This is going to be so much fun. I am so excited for this. We interview people in creative industries about their life, work, and hobbies while I doodle team. We asked people on Twitter if they had specific topics they wanted us to discuss. We're also on Instagram now. Check out our Instagram and YouTube. We also ask for prompts there. It's really cool. We're multi-platform as well as some drawing prompts. And today with us, we have Devin and Mick. Hi! I, Devin, the reason I didn't want to say your last name is that I need to ask you how to pronounce your last name on this show. No problem. Great to meet you, V. My last name is pronounced Bungie, like sort of like it looks, Devin Bungie. Oh, Bungie, that's really fun. I was going to say this, but then I was like, I was like wondering if there was like a little trick inside. <laughs> and <laughs> Nick uh, Stanton. That's right. I, I, that's an easy one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So you guys have like a really, like a really amazing career writing for Disney. You've, you wrote on live action shows and animated shows and now you are the creators and showrunners of Haley's on it uh I'm really excited for the show I've seen the pilot and it's so fun and so cute but before we talk about a lot about Haley's on it I wanted to ask you a little bit about your creative process and how you guys met and kind of like how you started your career writing cool yeah we met um in college, we were at the USC Film School. We were both freshmen in, in the same uh, uh, screenwriting program. And we had a, a class together and we were kind of the kids that messed around in the back of class and made jokes. And uh, I don't know, they must have labeled us like the troublemakers or something because we weren't in another class together for a number of years until we were seniors. And then we took a TV uh, writing class, which was taught by the... Um, showrunner the former showrunner of the jeffersons um jay moriarty who encouraged us to you know write a script together but that was sort of the format of that class and and it it worked out we we learned that we had like really similar sensibilities we're both from like small towns and the kind of the middle of nowhere but we loved the same tv shows and stuff like that and you know it just felt like we uh you know clicked and we wrote found that we wrote well together and um so after graduation uh we uh both worked um jobs that worked you know we didn't we weren't some of those people that that got into the the business right away you know there were some tough years and you know working side jobs i worked in a mail room um i think devin worked in tech support for a couple of years but all the while we were writing and, um, you know, we were able to get an agent and through just a lot of hard work and ups and downs, we eventually got our foot in the door at uh, Disney. Um, and it was actually in, in animation. I know we've worked in live action since, but um, our start was at TVA and and we were on staff of a couple shows there, uh, the replacements and Emperor's New School. And um, yeah, we've been writing together ever since. Uh, That's my so cool. It's cool. How uh, how long would you say was it years, uh, months, like between the moment when you guys graduated until the moment you like got your agent? Because you got your agent before you got your first job, right? Correct. Yeah, we were we were actually lucky because uh, our our professor Jay, who Nick mentioned, uh, former showrunner of the Jeffersons, he he was sort of also our mentor, and and his his agent when he was working had a son who was an agent at a small boutique agency um, and sent over our stuff that we had written mostly at school. Um, and we lucky enough, he, he responded to it. And with Jay's recommendation, you know, that helped a lot. Um, we were able to get our agent right away. Um, but it was several years after that, that we got our first paying job. <laughs> <laughs> That's I... yeah, two years, I think two, two or three years, three. I think. Yeah. Three. Yeah. <laughs> Devin totally remembers. We won't give dates, but yeah, it was uh, over three years. <laughs> I, I think it's really cool to hear because I feel like, you know, it can be, it can be just like a lot of pressure to graduate and then be like, you know, like I got to land uh, a job right away. And uh, it's cool to hear that you both kind of, do you feel like having 
these like different experiences, like the mail room and the IT kind of like helps you kind of have more life stories? Like, did you kind of use these experiences a little bit in your scripts or like, do you, where do you draw inspiration from the most life or TV? Uh, both. Yeah. I, I'll say I, one thing I'll add is, you know, one of the first jobs I did out of, out of uh, college, I, I, I worked while I was in college, I sort of paid the bills with, with working in the uh, IT department at USC. And then I thought one of the other things I thought, well, if, if I don't ever get a job, TV writing. I, I love video games as well. So I got a job working at um, a video game company just outside of LA as a QA testing video games. I was like, oh, this is going to be awesome. You know, I could literally just get to play video games all day. And it was the most soul sucking job. Like it was three, I don't even know, was I even there three months? I don't know, maybe Nick knows, but like it was literally playing a game that's so bad it reboots after like 30 seconds. You had a, a, a phone book sized list of what they called known bugs that they didn't want you to write up, but you were expected to find, you know, 10 new bugs every hour, even though you couldn't get the damn thing to start without it crashing. And like, you couldn't check your phone or your email or, you know, and it was just, I don't know, by, by the, and then, and on top of that, there was so much turnover, like literally every time I'd make a friend, they'd get laid off the next week or something. So it became one of those things I was begging to be let go. And, and, and after I survived another round of layoffs one week, I was like, I don't, Hair and I just walked in and said I'm leaving and then I left <laughs> and I decided I wasn't going to do uh, video games anymore and that but my point being uh, you know it took me a little bit to get back to it but I realized I love there's a lot of things I do love about video games and that was and that was um, as long as you approach it from the playing side um, and and one of, that was one of the main reasons we created a show called Gamer's Guide to Pretty Much Everything which was about a, 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 a essentially a professional video game uh, player. Um, but I don't know. It was it was seeing both sides of the world w really kind of shed a lot of light in, into the creating of that show. So cool! Like so, when you were, um, I, I oh man, I want to ask you guys both about pitching and also how often you would be writing scripts. Um, but I'm just going to go into pitching. Uh, when you were pitching um, the um, your show. Um, a guide to uh gaming were you like using your your experience as part of the pitch were you like oh this was like part of what i did uh and or were you kind of pitching it through more of like a story perspective um like kind of like you know more like the nuts and bolts of like oh this is our, our characters and like you know like the more traditional picture did you kind of like pitch it more through like your experience yeah, honestly, both are really important. I, I, you know, you have to have a good story. You have to have good characters. It has to be something that's engaging and, you know, the person you're pitching to has to get it. But if you can tie it to anything personal, that helps a lot. And it also, especially when you're young, um, I think anything that makes it seem like if this is a story that only you can tell will will make a huge difference. If there's some aspect, oh, because you know, I grew up here, or I my my family is this, or or I worked here. You know, any of that kind of stuff that makes it like, well, it's not. We're never going to find another person that has all those experiences to write this show. If it if it hits both of those check boxes, that that that's the best way to do it. That's really cool. I like that. I like that you're um, really highlighting these are all because it's easy for people to forget that our experience is unique. So like the way that you kind of described it, like, this is where I'm from and this is how my family's like, and this is what the town I grew up in was kind of like the vibe and stuff. And that's already unique. So I think that's really cool. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you guys real fast. Like, so when you guys were kind of like, you had your agent and you still wanted to break in, how often would you write a script together? Were you trying, did you self-impose like some kind of a deadline? Kind of like, oh, we need to have like a new spec every couple of months or like, or, and were you focusing more on specs or originals? We, it's a good question. We um, would, I think, write a script probably every couple months. And mm -hmm. we, at the time, focused more on, because I think we had maybe an original pilot, but we wrote a couple specs and this will date us at the time, but it was a uh, King of Queens and a Scrubs, I think. And we, we found that we were really good at 
capturing the voice of a show. Like, you know, we could just, you know, kind of get what the characters were. And we did a lot of research and watched every episode, obviously. And they were good, good specs. And they ended up, you know, getting us a lot of meetings. Um, but yeah, like we said, we were both working day jobs at the time. As part of my mailroom job, I was working sort of in a Hollywood mailroom. Part of your job was delivering scripts to the actual production company. Like you would actually drive and drop off scripts. And we were also taking meetings, you know, during uh, at that same time. So sometimes I wouldn't want to, you know, have them see me <laughs> being a delivery person. So I would, you know, put a hat on and and put the the script down at the, the front door and then go back that afternoon for a meeting at the same production company. So oh, that's so funny. <laughs> Did you like have like a like a different like costume? Like, oh, now I'm in a suit. <laughs> yeah, I would wear the blazer. Yeah. This is the look I would have for a meeting. But, uh, you know, to pay the bills, I had to be a delivery person to that same company. So <laughs> that's so funny. That's really cool. Um. Oh man, I want to, I think now I want to, so one of the cool things of having both of you guys here is that you have the show Haley's on it that's uh, premiering. So at the time of the, we record this episode, like way in advance, everyone who's like listening. So the show hasn't like yet premiered, but when the episode comes out, it's airing right now. So definitely check it out because it's a lot of fun. Um, I watched the pilot. It's really, really cute. Um, and the characters are like so endearing and there's just like so much packed in this pilot. Like not only do we get to meet these like adorable characters, but on top of that, we kind of have a feeling for like the full show, like what the, the goal of the show is going to be and like the kind of like comedy that we're going to see and also all of the kind of like adventures that are uh, awaiting us as an audience. I, I'm trying not to spoil too much <laughs> in the episode. But I wanted to ask you guys, how did you come up with the idea for Haley's On It? Like, um, what was that like for you guys to kind of like come up with that idea? And like, uh, I want to talk about that. You know, the, the the very first moment you get the idea when it comes from it, it starts, it's, it comes from like nowhere. Right. And then suddenly there's like a like a, a bud of an idea, like kind of what was that moment like? <laughs> <laughs> Well, what really happened when we were visited by future versions of ourselves. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, it was one of those things where we realized we were trying to, we were on a development deal at Disney at the time. Um, and we were just sort of thinking like, what kind of shows did we really love growing up? And and one of the things we kept going back to is like, we loved like when, the, when you could get a lot of comedy, uh, you know, from something with huge stakes, but with small actions or whatever like for example like bill and ted's excellent adventure like the whole goal of that movie is essentially to save the future of the world they have to pass their history test which we thought was pretty hilarious just sort of as a small you know small seinfeld level uh you know problems but it has these huge ramifications in the future um and combining that with with you know and there's another other shows we can think of where like there's just ordinary regular relatable characters who have to that are thrown into these extraordinary circumstances. Um, a show like Futurama um, or movies like Back to the Future and Terminator 2, things like that, where it's just like, I don't know, there's something very fun and relatable about being kind of thrown into that experience. So, so that was sort of the germ of, of this idea as we were trying to think of, a, a, you know, we were putting ourselves in the, you know, we, we wanted a character that was a, you know, 14 year old kid who who was sort of being pushed out of her comfort zone um and and we thought oh you know what she was making a list of everything that she ever you know thought she wanted to do but you know was never really planning on doing it or was you know because a lot of us do that right you something you know i want to put this i want to do this someday but i probably won't so i'll just put it on a list and then if i get around to it i'll do it but then if we had the added element of what if you found out later not only are you destined to do everything you're you are capable and it, it, it leads to great things and, the, and the, the, the future of the world essentially ends up in a better place because, because of this was the first step towards you becoming a great person. Um, we thought that put some really fun stakes on all these, these, these otherwise innocuous items. Yeah, I remember um, <clears throat> one other 
saying in the very early process, we we didn't have the whole idea, but I think we had this idea of a scene where this character who we now call the professor, but, um, you know, bursts in and tells our main character, Haley, you know, all this, like just dumps all this information on her, but we thought it would be funny if they just kind of keep getting sidetracked, right? You know, like, uh, I don't know. I mean, a, a version of this scene is in the is in the pilot, but just the tone of it was, you know, she'll throw out some thing, you know, and there's a Haley Tonium. Of, oh, wait, I, is that an element? Is that my name? You know, it's just like a two minute scene where it's just a total information dump about like, and then, you know, she gets stuck back into a portal. I don't know. We just thought that that was kind of, that would that would be kind of like a funny scene, and then we ended up making an animation test out of that scene, um, which sets up a lot of the series too. But um, you know, and then we just sort of added characters onto that. You know, what if she had this best friend Scott, and it was kind of a Jim and Pam kind of relationship, and and then this character of Beta, who's going to be one of the main characters, um, you know, kind of came from that too. And um, so yeah, it just sort of grew from there. That's really cool. And oh man, I love that scene too. I remember watching the pilot when there's like the professor coming in, kind of info dumping, but it's still really funny. Uh, I think it's like really clever because I was just like, oh, because it's, it, I would say it's kind of like a high concept show because there's like time travel in it. Uh, I mean, I guess the time travel element is just that character coming in giving all the information. I I don't know. I don't know if there's going to be more time travel later, but uh, I guess just that element kind of, I would say puts it in like a little bit of a high concept show. Um, how did you, how did that, how did, how do you pitch that? Because I know it's kind of hard sometimes to pitch time traveling ideas. Um, yeah. And we sort of purposely, you know, our goal was never to make it a time travel show. Mm -hmm. uh, we thought, we wanted a show that was very grounded. Like we said, we really like quite ordinary characters in crazy circumstances. So like we wanted to keep it pretty much exclusively set in present day. It takes place in Oceanside, really pretty part of um, Southern California. And, and, and the craziness kind of comes to our characters and then they have to deal with it. Um, so yeah. And, 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 you know, speaking to that scene and the high concept in a way it worked out because this is sort of after you pitch a show and sort of get people interested. This is sort of the, this is now the development process. Like we knew that the only way the show would get sort of greenlit or like get people hooked is if we could explain it to them very quickly. So like Nick said, we did an animation to like, we were, we, we knew at Disney, they do, they'll, they're, they'll pay for like a two minute sort of animation test. So we did everything we could to just cover that moment where Haley essentially learns all the stuff that you, that, you know, she's going to do and has to do and sort of set it up, but, you know, try to come up with a, a way to do it in a fun way. So it's quick, it's informative, but you also, you know, you get this sort of comedy tone and action tone and all that. So um, we sort of, it, it worked out very nicely that the show could be pretty, pretty well encapsulated in those. I think it ended up being three minutes. We had to ask for a little extra time, but it, it could be encapsulated in that kind of scene. Um, which is sort of in the in the first episode, you know, in a version. I think it's a little longer now. We we we, had, we were allowed to let it breathe, mm -hmm. um, but um, it was able. You know, we sort of were able to condense sort of the bigger mythology into that short concept, which which helped a lot. Yeah, and you know, one thing we also wanted to do with the the pilot was, you know, it's it's one of I think four episodes that uh that we did in the first season that are are i guess two parters or 22 minute episodes um and we used the, the first episode really just to set up the whole idea of what what the series is and you know who the characters are and what the rules are and everything like that and then you know purposefully so we don't have to do that necessarily every episode you know the, most of the episodes are 11 minute episodes after that um so it could just sort of be an adventure she's got a list item that she has to do it's you know spend all your old gift cards or something like that and then for, from that little thing they've got to go on a a road trip because the one butter burger restaurant is you know that is still in existence is uh, two states away and stuff like that and it kind of goes from there but um you know sort of setting up the the series allowed us a lot more freedom um in subsequent episodes to to you know that's really not, cool. not have to lay all that pipe 
Yeah, I was like, oh, that's really, I was wondering if that was going to be a 22 minute show or like an 11 minute. So that's really cool to see that you had the, a 22 minute to set up the the whole show and then you can, you're like on um, 11s. Um, yeah, that's, it, it. that's what I really liked about that pilot too. It was, I was like, oh, I can see how this can be like a pretty versatile show. And uh, but obviously we're going to have our main cast that we already love, uh, Haley Scott and Beta. <laughs> They were like, they were so fun together. I want to see, yeah, I'm really excited to see more of Beta. What was kind of like your, you guys' idea having him? Is he kind of like the conscience that keeps Haley on the, um, on track? He he serves a few purposes. I, I mean, one, we liked keeping sort of a science fiction element that sort of ties us to the, the bigger concept of we have access to the future technology, I guess. He also was, most importantly, it sort of gave us a way of sort of having uh, influence on what list items are going to be accomplished and where they all are so we don't have to kind of constantly bring out the paper list and kind of look through it and stuff. He he can mm -hmm. calculate, you know, all these probabilities and kind of encourage her to, uh, well, the fair's in town this week. We have to go, you have to go ride every ride at the county fair or, or something similar. Um, it also allows us to know you know, she's trying to put off an item. No, that's that has dangerous consequences. And, and you know, this is your, the, the windows are closing, things like that. So he's he's just sort of a a, a, a character that really helps um, sort of keep those stakes uh, at the forefront. And he's also super funny. Uh, Gary, Gary Anthony Williams plays plays the character and, and brings a, just an incredible amount of comedy and just his attitude and, and and stuff just playing off you know these two two regular teens who can get very distracted and love to do goofy dumb things together and and he's mostly all business but slowly starts to find his own uh interests and things that sort of <laughs> can distract him as well that's really cool oh man yeah i really love him i was just um i was just like before the show started, I was like, oh, I hope we get plushies of him. He's so cute. <laughs> we do too. Uh, my, my kids have already asked for beta plushies for Christmas. So, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Uh oh, any... you have to make that happen now. <laughs> yeah. Already got him on my phone here. Got a little sticker. So, um, but yeah, uh, if any consumer products people from Disney are, are listening, uh, beta plushies are going to be, yeah. <laughs> it would be a huge hit, I think. <laughs> That's so cute. And so I want to um, kind of hear a little bit from you guys. So you had the little two minute um, clip that you had for Haley. Uh, and then once you showed that and everybody got excited, what's kind of like the next step after like, because that's kind of like a proof of concept, right? That's kind of like... Uh, like kind of like this is how it's going to kind of look and feel like and like how much from a two minute clip uh can you quote unquote like change like do you feel like it, it were you making it thinking like oh it's gonna stay like this for the show or is there like room for uh r d still kind of like more room for like changing the art and room for changing the story still kind of i want to understand a little bit that process I guess from that to the next step and you know yeah well we actually did um there were sort of two things that we worked on simultaneously one was the two minute um you know clip of basically that scene and and what was nice was we were able to get that fully animated and it was in color and everything like that um the other thing that we did was an animatic um and mm. I'm sure your audience knows what that is you know it's mm. it's a sort of a storyboard but the, you know you get the actors voices and things like that mm. and um that was i think we had a, a 14 minute animatic or something like that mm -hmm. so we were able to show and i think it worked out well because you know there's a testing process and you know research and stuff like that but we were able to show kids the three minute animation thing mm -hmm. so they knew who the characters were they knew what the show looked like mm -hmm. and then we could show them the animatic so they still had the idea in their head. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes if you just show an animatic, it can be kind of difficult. They're like, mm -hmm. you know, because these are seven, eight year old kids. They're like, is the show going to be in black and white? Like, no, yeah. you got to <laughs> use your imagination. It's going to be different. Yeah. So 
Um, we showed those two things to, you know, an audience. We did some some testing, some focus testing, and uh, it ended up getting a really, really positive response. Um, you know, it was, we produced most of it during the pandemic. So there was like some. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's voices right. And, you know, we just kind of cobbled some things together, but um, I think we sort of told, told the story in a, in a way that kids got and got them excited about it. And, and to your question, the whole purpose of that, honestly, is R&D. Um, you know, mm. not only are all the people that are deciding whether or not they want to make a show out of this thinking and seeing and deciding if they like it, what they see, um, but like Nick said, the, all the kids that we, you know, they did testing for uh, boys and girls up like three different age groups. Um, mm. And there's, there's, you know, they always have a lot of feedback. Honestly, we've done, you know, this is now our third uh, show we've created and mm. done, been in the testing process. And it was pretty minimal changes, especially considering, um, you know, we sort of we're, we're working with, you know, development artists and stuff who are just sort of pinch hitting for us. Uh, they're all super talented, luckily, and did a great job. But, um, you know, we there's there is a, definitely a growing process on the show. And we, we got a little bit of feedback and, and implemented that. Um, and and but then, you know, once people realize, yeah, we think there's a show here and the kids are going to get behind it and. And all that, then we sort of got the final sign off to make a series, and we figured out a lot more stuff as far as <laughs> that's what you worry about producibility and how mm -hmm. much you know. You know, we, we were pretty ambitious in our pilot because you know we kind of have to be to sell it, and we wanted to kind of explore that world. But then you have to be a little more responsible with number of characters and voices and backgrounds, and you know, there's a lot of stuff to consider just from a more practical sense once you're actually in in series. Yeah, and talking about being responsible with <laughs> going into series. How is your experience, how is your experience different from running a show in live action to running a show in animation? Because I feel like both of them, you have to be responsible, like you said, but I'm guessing in different ways, right? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you know, um, there's actually a, a lot of crossover, I think, in terms of, uh, first of all, I mean, I think a good story is a good story, um, you know, and, and the elements of, telling a good story are there, whether it's a live action show or an animated show. Mm. Um, you know, I think luckily we worked in animation before, so we sort of had, we had a background um, for it. You know, a lot of people I think think, well, it's animated, so you can do whatever you want. Yeah. You know, you have a football <laughs> yeah. stadium full of people and stuff yes. like that. It's like, no, that's it actually has to be drawn by people. You know, I know they don't have to build a football stadium, but uh, that's that's a lot of <laughs> stuff. Yeah. You got to design those people who are in the football stadium and things like that. So, um, yeah, you know, the the producibility of it was, and, and it was it's exactly like Devin said. You know, we we did the the animatic of, of the pilot without really taking those things into consideration. We, you know, it's a, it was sort of a sales tool. And then once you actually get to, you know, the episodes themselves, you know, you've got to be responsible, you know, like on a, on our live action shows, we knew the rules, right? There were two main sets and a swing set every, every week. And, you know, occasionally we could kind of maybe go outside or do a location thing, but, um, and a lot of our writing staff has had a live action background too. So they were pretty good when we gave them an edict. There was a point in the season where we were, you know, just doing too many backgrounds and, and, you know, you know, ambitious, you know, it was, it was good, but we sort of had to scale back, but uh, people really um, sort of took the note and, and took their live action experience of, okay, what stories can we tell maybe in our existing sets? And I'll, I'll say like one of my favorite episodes of the season, was, it'll come up mid season is this episode of Kissed Opportunities, which is takes place totally in, in Haley's backyard, but it's, she's trying to host a cool party, but she does it in her kind of dorky Haley way. And um, somebody brings a party game that may be too mature for the party. And I don't know, it's just all about all the character dynamics, but it was all shot in one location. Oh, nice. Kind of like a, like almost like a bottle episode, but in a backyard. So <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> that's really cool. I I like that. I like that you 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 mentioned in live action. You guys have to be very conscious of sets. So it, it's it's interesting to hear that there's a little bit of that that can be useful for animation as well. Um, yeah, honestly, all I mean, all 
producing any show, there's, there's, you, you just have to know what your limitations are and what your constraints mm -hmm. are. And, and, and sometimes that's a, a, a benefit, you know, like mm -hmm. if we wanted someone to, to, you know, step on an airbag and get thrown in a live action show, that's a lot harder to do than in animation, you know, <laughs> or, you know, there's just certain things you can do in animation that are easier and certain things in live action that are a little easier. But, you know, once you know the parameters, it, you can, you can really find the funny in, in any situation. Can you give some examples to illustrate that? I think that would be really fun to hear, like, like what's the big, like, no-no in live action and, and something that's very innocuous in live action and that's really hard in animation? <laughs> <laughs> the one, well, one thing say, I can... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Nick. Oh, okay. Well, in live action, I'll say one thing that was very, could, could be very hard was, uh, you know, like, a lot of stunts or whatever, like, you know, it, this episode ended up looking looking good, but there was an episode in one of our live action shows where they're baking these uh, eclairs and, you know, like custard, you know, like was supposed to like squirt out of them. And it was this big set piece and stuff like that. But, you know, you get there on the day and the squirting mechanism doesn't work. And, you know, <laughs> then you're like, what do you do? And I don't know, you've got to kind of pivot. Whereas in animation, like a scene like that, I think you could you could probably do pretty easily. But there's probably things that are that are true in the other in the other direction too. Um, so anyway, Devin, what were you gonna say? Sorry. Yeah, I was gonna. I was just gonna add. We had there was one show we tried to get get done on a, on our last live action show where they where a character essentially went out on a boat and got lost at sea. Um, but we could not convince the network that we could we could make a convincing water <laughs> that would have had to be all digital and. You know the set would have been the boat itself but like it was it would you know it would have been a lot of work but and we ultimately didn't end up doing it but now we like even in one of our first episodes we have uh scott and Haley quickly go out onto a boat hunting a hunting a a, a fish for that are trying to make the best fish tacos in oceanside um but that's actually you know all daylight out on a boat is actually incredibly easy to do an animation it's you know there's <laughs> sky and water and a boat and and it ended up looking beautiful and was one of our first easy, easier shows. Um, so, you know, that's just sort of the difference of, of you know, you wouldn't necessarily know why one would be easier than the other, but that was definitely one of them. So funny. Yeah. We just say you guys kept a list of like, oh, couldn't do that and are trying to <laughs> put it in <laughs> Haley. <laughs> Sometimes. We'll definitely, we'll, sometimes we'll have, we'll have episode ideas like from, show to show like where we really like an idea for an episode and it just doesn't quite fit for the show or for the mm -hmm. characters or whatever and and then a, a, another a version of that will end up making its way into another show oh yeah oh yeah yeah that's smart yeah 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 uh how do you guys keep your ideas together like do you use the cloud or are you just like email buddies or dms or text how do you kind of keep like or are you just always together and you're just talking constantly all of the above, I'd say. <laughs> I'd say the majority of ideas we've had have disappeared into the ether, but <laughs> the stuff we really like or makes each other laugh, we try to write down or remember somewhere. <laughs> or tell tell someone on the writing staff and then they can keep a note of it. And we have a, a big wall of ideas too in our in our writer's room, which we put up on thumbtacks and you know, if you ever need an episode idea, we can go back to it. So yeah, we do all that, all of those things. That's cool. I was gonna ask you about uh, because so this is your third show that you pitch and ran. What would you say, kind of like? Well, I guess, uh, yeah. What what if you were to give yourself some advice from the first time you pitched and ran? <laughs> what what would you tell yourself? In like it could be anything. Like I don't know. Like don't stress out too much, or it can be like dream bigger. I don't know. What what yeah. what would be the advice you would give yourself? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll first say that they're two diff very different things. I think p pitching a show and then and then being, you know, running a show, uh, two very different skills. I'll just say off the bat, pitching is, we hate it. <laughs> you know, it, it's just something we have to do it because that's part of the job. And that's what you have to do to get a show off the ground. But we are not, you know, we're we're writers by trade, right? We, mm -hmm. we can write a really good script, but you know, the salesmanship of that is is really tough sometimes. So, what I found is helpful, and Devin kind of alluded to this, is you know, 
connecting to it on a on like a personal level, I think is, mm -hmm. you know, he, he mentioned a gamer's guide, you know, he had a background working in video games and, and, you know, brought that experience there. And so we could, you know, pitch it with some authority and, um, you know, uh, and I guess just believing in the idea, um, you know, yourself. And, and I think that's contagious and, and you know, in terms of, of, you know, pitching an idea, uh, Show running is uh, sort of a different skill set, but I guess to your pitching question, um, you know, find a personal connection and and um, you know really get invested in it. Yeah, one of the things we heard early on, and it proved true, was one: you're for every I guess good meeting, you're going to have fifty <laughs> where nothing <laughs> happens, or you you don't do a great job, or it's just you know there's no connection or whatever. So expect a lot of just failure and just keep going mm. and then uh I, I forget who it was another I think it was another student uh of, of Jay's that told us like you have to be yourself times 10 in every meeting you know what I mean mm. like you have to like find the most fun engaging version of yourself you know and it's it's not that you're not you're supposed to be fake or anything like that but you just really have to kind of in a small amount of time with somebody you don't really know you might not even really connect with at all but you have to act like you know you you really want to be there and you really love them and you love this project and you want, you love their project and you know any of that kind of stuff I think is is very helpful that's that's really funny that you you bring that up because I, I feel like that's something that's always like you know like I myself kind of pitch uh every now and then uh I don't think I've I've nowhere near to the amount you guys have pitched obviously but uh I you know you get in these meetings and you meet someone and you're like oh gosh I kind of looked them up on IMDb or LinkedIn but I don't know that much about them but then it's like kind of like oh how much do I ask them about themselves and how much do I talk about myself and it's just kind of like almost like speed dating <laughs> kind of experience exactly. so you're just like ah! <laughs> uh do you how do you prepare for like um these kind of meetings do you just kind of like wing it or do you have a little routine we we try to keep in our pocket a few stories that either have worked or we think are sort of appropriate or funny or something mm -hmm. just so that we have something to sort of fall back on if if you know if it's you're running out of other things to say mm -hmm. um but yeah just kind of knowing knowing who you're talking to and what you are trying to get across whether if you're pitching something obviously you want to get across your your ideas um but if it's a general or something just sort of selling yourself that sort of thing and we also try and do you know research before the meeting too and find out first of all who the person is that we're pitching to and also you know if there's anything we can glean like if they're looking for a certain mm. kind of project you know going back to gamers guide we kind of got clued in that they were looking for to to do a show something in the world of video games and mm. so we you know, we just kind of ran with that, you know, and, and presented it in a way that, you know, only it was a story that only only we could tell. Um, so I think doing your research that and, and you know, we did that a little bit with with Haley, too. We kind of knew some elements that maybe the the studio was looking for and things like that. But then came, pitched a story that that we were really excited about and that, you know, that fit that as well. I'll also say, you know. Another thing I'd recommend is lear learning from your failures. Like, mm -hmm. like one of our first meetings, I think out of college, we met on a show that was about to get picked up. It was in the trades as this is one of the things we expect to go on. It was on a network show, it was a live action show with a showrunner who was who had a great track record and a, and a star from like you know a comedian and stuff. Mm -hmm. And we met with him, and and it was a great meeting. And he told us in the room, you know, yeah, we're going to hire you guys if, if and when we go. And we're like, sweet, this is easy, you know. <laughs> but next week they didn't pick it up. They picked up something else. You know, what? uh they were like, well, okay, you know, it's it's easy though. And then we'll get another one, you know, and I think two years later we're like, you know, I don't think we're necessarily gonna just be given another job like that. So, you know, that's when we started realizing, you know, we might have to make our own work. You know, that that sort of inspired us to sort of just start, okay, well, we can't just wait to get staffed. Mm -hmm. Um, because apparently that's sort of a lot of luck as well as as your meetings and scripts and all that mm. um so we started developing there and then the first thing we developed was actually it was somebody else's idea mm. uh, it was some art that they had but it was at our same agent and we 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 spent 
we designed on to, to kind of write up a script for it and sort of develop it into a show. We learned a lot doing that, but we got paid, I don't know, a, a, a pittance to work for about 18 months <laughs> developing this thing. And eventually it got going and it, it, it went ahead, but sort of we had no credits at the time and there was not a lot of interest in us running it because we literally had just done some writing before. So, you know, we ended up doing 18 months of work for, for like $2,000 and, and realized even though it was not a good payoff in the long run, like we did learn a ton about sort of developing a show, coming up with mm. characters, filling out, you know, storylines, backgrounds, worlds, all that kind of stuff. So even though both of those like on their surface were like, oh, what a waste of time, what a pain in the butt. I can't believe we missed out on this opportunity. You know, we probably wouldn't be able to be where we are now if both of those things hadn't happened. Yeah, I think that's super great advice because I do feel like when you start out, like there is a little bit of that moment when you're like, oh, you got to kind of do the odd jobs. But then like you were saying, like not only do you learn from it, but you're also probably making a lot of like connections as you're like working on that. Like, um, I don't know if like any of these uh connections that like paid off later in your career like that you got through developing this project um we definitely yeah, kept, yeah we definitely kept in contact with a lot of the, the showrunner of, of that first show that we almost got we've been in contact we never actually ended up working with him but he's he's done another number of new shows and he's he's kind of introduced us to other people and stuff like that so that's been cool oh, and then awesome. yeah sorry nick do you have a thought yeah, um, I would say just another piece of advice is just be nice to people on your way up. I mean, you know, we were uh, in our when we were trying to get our foot in the door and when we worked our first few jobs, you know, not in any kind of phony way, just a genuine way. We we really wanted to connect with people on the crew, you know, and we built friendships. Right. And uh, with young, you know, people and artists and writers who were doing the same thing that that we were doing and you know you'd be amazed how you know 15 years later all those connections are are still there they still come up and and we have this sort of network of of people that we uh can rely on and you know you it's it's kind of a small world at, at you know at that point and and we we're, we're lucky in that sense i feel bad for people who you know we have a lot of young artists and and young um young people who are working on our crew and and we started off the show started off production and it was still the pandemic and um you know they never had that at least for the first maybe year i guess of, of the show didn't have that office experience of like being in person with other people and like you know meeting people and and sort of creating a network which was hugely valuable to us in our first few jobs you know we've um, worked with a lot of those same people and you get to you know and even when we're now we're in a position to hire people and we've that's what we think about you know have they done good work in the past are they good people are they you know and so that you know i i think just just be nice make connections with people you never know where your next job is going to come from and um you know what these connections will come uh, will will amount to yeah yeah that's so true i feel like so much of like yeah like you said like the pandemic was so tricky because um for everybody's first job who was during the pandemic then you you only get to meet the people on your crew but you don't get to meet the other people in the studio and sometimes just like hanging out by the water cooler or like the coffee machine and just talking to people that are not on your crew and then that's like connections that you build you build your network that way and it's easier to find next jobs but i mean I think this is going to change soon. I feel like studios are bringing people back in. I feel like this is experience of like working from home is <laughs> maybe <laughs> coming to an end. I don't know. It's uh, it's kind of back and forth, like um, the temperature on that. Uh, I yeah. just want to sneak in a, one question from one of our listeners. It's a short episode, everyone. So unfortunately, we can't get through all of the questions. There was a lot of great questions uh from our patreon listeners and from twitter uh but i think we're gonna go with biat linsbeat our patron who asked can you tease us with anything about Haley? anything you guys want to tease about the show <laughs> all right uh what could we tease um I'll, I'll, I'll say you know even though Haley is sort of uh 
you know, an introvert who who is scared to try new things er early on in the season, she'll sort of realize she can and likes singing in front of people. And since we have an incredibly talented uh, uh, actress, Ellie uh, Cravalho, as our as our lead, we uh, she 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 continues to deliver, you know, all sorts of awesome performances whenever we ask her to do some songs. So there will be more and more Haley performing as as the season goes on. That's so amazing. Yeah, like it's so cool that there's like songs. Like the song in the pilot is so funny. Uh, technically, it's the one in the in the right, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I love that kind of uh, humor where it's very much like this is what's happening and you can't do anything about it. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's really funny. Um. I uh I thought that was such a really really fun episode. Thank you so much for like talking so much about like all of the nuts and bolts. That's like my favorite thing to talk about on Creative Walk. I think it was really inspiring, and I love what you. I think it was you, Devin, who said about like for one good meeting, there's like fifty bad meetings. I'm like, that's so much yeah. a good. <laughs> that's such a good uh piece of advice. Like to to not like feel you know. Um, what's the word like? You know, like it can be easy sometimes in this industry to feel like, oh no, nothing's working my way, and like you know, a little bit like uh, sad about it, I guess. So like that's a really good way to kind of keep the hope, you know, and like um, to like learn from failures and like put out the best work. So I think that's really really cool. Um, I the running gag on creative block is that I'm terrible at segues and <laughs> usually my co-host Sean is amazing he finds the best way to like jump from a subject to another seamlessly uh I lack that talent I'm working on it but I think I am going to close this episode of creative block um like I said it was going to be a short episode but I was just so so excited to hear about the process all these amazing stories I think that was so fun to hear how like you came up with that idea and how you pitched it and all the little like steps in development um so with this that is the end of this creative block Devin and Nick thank you so much for being our guests and sharing your story and thanks to your listeners. Follow us on Twitter. It's at CRTV Block, but also on Instagram because Twitter is having a hard time right now. So we're moving to Instagram where we ask for drawing prompts and questions to ask for guests. Huge thanks to our editor Clements for editing the podcast. Clements is also a video game beta tester. So she will yeah. relate to your story, Devin. And I admire her greatly. Yeah. <laughs> And Marco, thanks to Marco for helping us produce the show. If you love our show, then support us on Patreon. It helps us pay for things like the Google Drive, the Zoom, and, um, you know, keep our amazing editor and producer paid. Um, becoming a patron gets you early access to interviews as well as bonus episodes. Click the link in the description of this episode. I have been your host, V, keeping creative, and we'll see you next week. Bye! Thanks so much, V. Thanks, <laughs> Thank v. you.